who have gone to Myanmar schools. Do you guys remember writing those weird English essays? Like myself? <laughs> Even if I don't want to talk about myself, right? But what about my favorite teacher? <laughs> I don't have one. I just have to say I love her, right? Well, one of my most traumatic childhood experiences was with one of those English essays. I was in my eighth grade English class, and we had to write down, or more correctly, copy the essay that our teacher wrote on the blackboard. The title, A Visit to My Favorite Place. <laughs> the first sentence went like this. Last summer, I went to Ngapli or Pyeongle. <laughs> hmm, how did we go to Ngapli or Pyeongle? Anyone who has some basic knowledge of Myanmar geography would immediately say that Nepali and Pune are actually very, very far, like hundreds of kilometers apart across mountains, rivers, and valleys. There's no awe about it. So I held my hand up and I asked the seemingly innocent question of why. Why are we using awe here, Siyama? Her answer was curt. It's okay to use awe. Hmm. Well, obviously not very satisfied with her answer or the lack of the answer, really. I asked her again why it was okay to use or. <laughs> Slightly agitated, she said, well, sometimes or can mean end. <laughs> oh, not that satisfied either. I asked her, how did those two words come to have the same meaning? Before I knew it, there I was in front of the entire class asked to pull my pants down. Soon, a few cane lashes landed on my bare buttocks because I asked many why and how questions. A reward for my childhood critical thinking. Of course, as you can imagine, I hated that teacher back then. <laughs> but rather than hating her, now I've learned to analyze her feelings. Why was she so angry? Perhaps she felt threatened? But why did she feel threatened, right? The answer is actually deeper than it looks. The spirit of a dictatorial regime that permeated every fabric of our society, it is that spirit that made questioning a rebellious act. It is that spirit that made curiosity an undesirable trait. In fact, our education system never escaped the touch of that spirit. There I was a little boy asking so many questions, and of course she was gonna feel really threatened or embarrassed. This is not a condescending. This is my understanding. Now that I've learned to understand the way she felt on that particular rainy day, now I've learned to work with people like her, who themselves were products of a broken education system. I have faith in the power of our youth, and which is why I came back. Particularly in this day and age, I see hope only in our youth. And I believe that our youth can look past all those grievances that they have, or are having, like I did, so that they could change the course of history for a better Myanmar. But they need empowerment. And we need to make sure that our youth, for them to become future leaders of this country, to have two basic key skills, which are two sides of the same coin, really. We need to educate so that they can not only think about issues critically, but also work with other people empathetically. Our world today is technologically advanced more so than ever. Artificial intelligence, robotics, and automation on the horizon will unleash disruptive power on the job market. Two thirds of today's job market, or two thirds of today's job positions will disappear a decade from now. We've got mobile banking that threatens to replace many people and out of jobs. We've got Apple Siri that is poised to, to replace personal assistants. I get sometimes scared when my smartphone starts telling me, you have new memories, or you have memories from days that I've already forgotten about. Now that information is literally at our fingertips in this age of smartphones, the real challenge of this century is not whether we have technological access to the right information. 
It is whether you have intellectual access to the right information. And we need to make sure that our youth have these skills and are relevant for the, not just for the next five years, but also for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So, how can we nurture our youth so that they are ready for the next century? We need to make sure that our youth have both skills, critical thinking and empathetic thinking. We are bombarded with so much information, objective facts as well as subjective feelings, opinions, and biases. And to think critically, we have to analyze all the information that we receive daily. And we have to ask ourselves, what are the facts in this gigantic pool of information? From these facts, we draw conclusions, and this process happens in the left side of the brain. By thinking empathetically, we focus on the other side. Subjective feelings, opinions and biases, and then how they come about. And this process happens in the right side of the brain. So first, how do we hone critical thinking in our youth? Many people would say, just make them ask a lot of questions. But I would say, make them ask a lot of why and how questions, because it is why and how questions that make us think of cause and effect. I went to a small liberal arts college in the United States, and um, I'll never forget that this class that I had to take in my senior year. It's the kind of class that I had the love-hate, or perhaps more correctly, hate-love relationship. And the course, ad infinitum, controversy, paradox, perplexity, and the idea of the infinite. Oh, God. What was it about, right? Was it about Avengers Infinity War? Or Star Wars Infinities? It would have been fun, but it was none of these. It was actually about the actual concept of infinity, which was so elusive that all of us have struggled even in our own imagination. It was kind of like a smorgasbord class with concepts of infinity uh, from various fields, like a Zeno's paradoxes in ancient Greek philosophy, calculus in mathematics, and of course, the ultimate infinite universe and space in astronomy. We were asked to argue and defend our own formulations of infinity. Yeah. Oh, defend our own formulations of infinity. We, are, we discussed why this argument and how that argument, and to be honest, most of the time, I had no freaking clue what the heck we we're talking about. <laughs> no freaking clue at all. So, I got depressed and I'm, I'm like, why the heck are we taking this class for God's sake? So eventually I came to realize the point of that class was thinking critically by asking a lot of why and how questions, which are of course hallmarks of critical thinking. Equally important to critical thinking is empathetic thinking, which unfortunately is much less emphasized in our schools. In a diverse country like Myanmar, we need to make sure that nation building, since a nation building requires us to work together with many people from diverse backgrounds, races, religions, ethnicities, and perspectives, we need to make sure that our youth are empathetic. Understanding why people feel the way they do, why people think the way they do, is crucial to building peace and harmony. Genuine empathetic thinking, however, requires us to move from, oh, I have experienced that before, so I understand you, to, oh, I have not experienced that before, but I understand you. At Parmi Institute, which I founded with a group of my friends, we have a week-long research field trip to some villages um, near Kalo, and um, so such a great excuse to get out of this lovely city. <laughs> we usually hike for miles, stop in some villages here and there, and then we talk to villagers. Once a group of my friends and I went to the house of a family, and uh, the father was out and about, uh, the mother was cooking dinner with her daughter, and we started chatting in the chilly air. 
And I asked her, how many children do you have? She said, two other boys and her. Without seeing the boys, I asked her, where are the boys? The younger is out with his dad, with a slight pause. She said, the older boy is in the city working as a waiter. I later learned that the, the, the older boy was not even 13 yet. And these cases are not isolated cases. This is actually quite common throughout Myanmar. I, for one, had the thought and judged them as short-sighted villagers. But when we actually sat down and listened to their fears and hopes, we got to see a fuller picture. With few opportunities available in villages, they felt the cities provided a wider network. And older siblings working in cities meant younger siblings could go to school. And many other reasons abound. I'm not trying to justify child labor here. On the contrary, the very act of exploring these fears and hopes help our students understand the feelings behind it. And this led to constructive approaches towards addressing child labor. Field trips and human interactions are vital to cultivating empathetic thinking. Nelson Mandela once said that a good head and a good heart are always a formidable combination. And we need to make sure that our youth have both so that they could become future leaders of this country. Critical thinking and empathetic thinking, of course, are quite different, but yet they are quite complementary as well. Critical thinking in the left side of the brain and empathetic thinking in the right side of the brain must work together. Only a brain that is whole is useful enough to address challenges that are facing our youth tomorrow. Thank you.